Good afternoon. We're going to resume the Commission's hearings on the petition on organohalogens. Uh, just to remind our speakers, uh, each speaker will have five minutes to present their testimony. The speakers will see behind me somebody flashing a card telling you how much time you have left, and I apologize in advance for cutting you off, but this is a very, very busy day, uh, in the same way that I'm cutting the commissioners off if, if we go too long. Uh, our, we have uh, several guests uh, on Panel 5, and I'd like to introduce them. First, we have Ms. Rachel Weintraub from the Consumer Federation of America. Ms. Katie Huffling from the Alliance of Nurses for Family Environments, welcome. Ms. Kathleen Curtis, uh, Clean and Healthy New York. And Mr. Jeff Ger Gerhard from the Ecology Center and also the American Sustainable Business Council. And finally, um, but not least, uh, Mr. Brian McGannon from the American Sustainable Business Council. Uh, Ms. Weintraub, would you please begin? Yes, I'm uh, Rachel Weintraub. Legislative Director and General Counsel at Consumer Federation of America. I appreciate the opportunity to provide comments on the petition that CFA, Earth Justice, and others submitted to the CPSC, urging you to adopt mandatory standards under the FHSA to protect consumers from the health, health hazards caused by the use of non-polymeric additive form organohalogen flame retardants in children's products, furniture, mattresses, and the casings surrounding electronics. I will discuss the CPSC's legal authority to adopt standards under the FHSA and why labeling is not adequate and some other things if I have time. You heard earlier today from Dr. Birnbaum that all of the chemicals in this class have the capacity to cause injury which meets the FHSA toxic standard. There is no formula for what is toxic nor is there a specific risk threshold before regulation is warranted. Non-polymeric additive form organohalogen flame retardants pose chronic hazards to consumers because of their physical, chemical, and biological properties. Through the reasonably foreseeable handling or use of children's products, furniture, mattresses, and electronics, consumers can be exposed to these chemicals since they migrate out of the product. Courts have not questioned that a variety of household products containing chemicals are hazardous substances, and these courts have also given deference to the CPSC's determinations. For example, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals agreed with the CPSC that foam spray paint intended for use by children is a hazardous substance under the FHSA. The court deferred to the agency's interpretation and emphasized that the statute only required that the product may cause substantial injury and did not require that the product would likely cause injury. There is solid precedent for regulating classes of products under the FHSA. In Toy Manufacturers of America versus the CPSC, a toy manufacturer trade association challenged a FHSA rule which banned toys with small parts that posed choking hazards to young children. The toy industry argued that the FHSA was intended to deal only with specific individual articles and not with a broad range of products at the same time. The court soundly rejected this argument, saying that the FHSA does not require slowly banning individual products, and the legislative history of appears clear in favoring general prescriptive regulations of the broadest, most comprehensive type. The class of flame retardants in the petition is like small parts in toys. These chemicals are intrinsically dangerous because of their inherent characteristics. Consumer products in the four categories at issue pose hazards when they contain any organohalogen flame retardant because these semi-violatile chemicals migrate out of the products and attach to other media such as house dust. Thus, for the purpose of being a hazardous substance under the FHSA, each foreseeable way that these four categories of products are used can pose risk of harm to consumers if these chemicals are added. The CPSC has regulated products containing specific hazardous chemicals under the FHSA. The request in this petition is consistent with those previous actions. The CPSC found that a number of substances are determined to be banned hazardous substances because they possess such a degree or nature of hazard that adequate cautionary labeling cannot be written and the public health and safety can be served only by keeping such articles out of interstate commerce. Examples include the CPSC's ban of mixtures that are intended primarily for applications application to interior masonry walls, floors as a water repellent, and these are also extremely flammable, among many others. The hazards posed by non-polymeric additive form organohalogen flame retardants cannot be effectively addressed by a label. When addressing 
a product safety hazard. The safety hierarchy establishes a recommended approach, first to design it out, second to guard, and third to warn. If a product poses a safety hazard to consumers, the first and most effective step is to eliminate the hazard. The lowest level of the hierarchy is warning consumers of the hazard, and those only work sometimes. Warnings are generally most effective when the user already believes that the risk exists, and warnings are least effective when there's no perceived risk as there is with these chemicals. Also, there's no particular type of use or behavior that a consumer could take to avoid adverse health impacts from such exposure. I also want to address the issue of um, the EPA. Um, there are numerous issues in our government where different agencies have different authority over what could appear to be similar issues. However, in this case, and there are others who are much more familiar with the EPA who will be talking about this, but the EPA's actions on flame retardants is unclear at this point. As has been stated, the 50 chemicals that are considered to be flame retardants have not been identified as being chemicals in this class. And there's broad, broad agreement that um, TSCA is in need of reform and that chemical regulation in this country needs to be amended. I thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you so much. Ms. Huffling? Thank you so much. Um, thank you for this opportunity to comment at this hearing today. My name is Katie Huffling, and I direct the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. I'm also a nurse and a nurse midwife. <clears throat> the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments is the only national nursing organization that focuses solely on environmental health issues. Our mission is to promote healthy people in healthy environments by educating and leading the nursing profession advancing research, incorporating evidence-based practice, and influencing policy. We have over 3,000 members throughout the country. Our members include nurses from all walks of our profession, hospital-based, public health, school-based, academic, and advanced practice, to name just a few. Nurses are the most trusted profession, and we take our duties very seriously when providing education to patients and working to prevent disease. The main work of our organization occurs through the generous volunteer work of our nurses. Through our policy and advocacy work group, these nurses have led engagement of health professionals on the serious issues related to flame retardants and health. Our work has been guided by the American Nurses Association Resolution, Nursing Practice, Chemical Exposure, and Right to Know, which advocates a course of action that reduces the use of toxic chemicals demands adequate information on the health effects of chemicals and chemicals and products before they are introduced on the market, and creates more streamlined methods for toxic chemicals to be removed from use. Based on this resolution, nurses need to advocate for consumer products that are free of toxic chemicals as part of their standard of practice. I'm highly concerned that pregnant women, the growing fetus, and our children are being exposed to halogenated flame retardants every day. It's my job to help women have the healthiest pregnancies possible. As such, I recognize the importance of having normal levels of thyroid hormones during pregnancy and monitors for symptoms of thyroid dysfunction so that action can quickly be taken if an abnormality is found. That this class of flame retardants are structurally similar to thyroid hormone and have been shown to disrupt thyroid function is highly concerning. Thyroid disruption during pregnancy can have a negative impact on fetal brain development as well as other poor pregnancy outcomes. With one in six kids in the U.S. now facing lifelong challenges of developmental disabilities such as autism and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, we need to seriously address chemicals that could be a component of this alarming trend. I'm also concerned with the effects of halogenated flame retardants on fertility. Elevated PBDE levels in human breast milk have been correlated with undescended testes, as well as decreased testes size and decreased sperm counts. As infertility is increasing in this country, we need to be addressing these possible chemical origins. As a nurse midwife, I'm frequently asked which products are safe to use with their baby. Which nursing pillow would I recommend? What's the best crib to buy? Due to the limited information we have on many of the flame retardants addressed in this petition, it can be very challenging as a provider to offer advice on the safest products. This is especially frustrating when it's been shown that these toxic chemicals are not even provided added flame protection. 
In speaking with my pediatric nurse colleagues, they've described how they have many ways that we can counsel our patients to reduce risks of fire, such as having working smoke detectors and not smoking in the house, but they have no meaningful advice to give to parents on how to reduce the risk of kids' exposure to flame retardants. Manufacturers are able to add halogenated flame retardants to their products without labeling, nor proving they are safe for use. I'm encouraged to see that electronic cases are included in this proposal. Kids now play with smartphones and other electronics seemingly before they can walk. Since halogenated flame retardants aren't chemically bound to the cases, they can easily transfer to the children's hands and skin and into their bodies. By banning the use of these flame retardants in cases, we can limit this important exposure source. This entire class of flame retardants all have a similar molecular structure and all are likely to react similarly in the human body. Our next generation deserves to be able to grow up healthy and free of these toxic chemicals. Let's not make the mistake of regrettable substitutions and adopt the current proposal to restrict these unnecessary and health harming class of flame retardants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Curtis. And thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm Kathleen Curtis. I'm also a nurse. I'm the executive director of Clean and Healthy New York, which is a state level group uh, representing thousands of New Yorkers working for uh, safer chemicals, a sustainable economy, and a healthier world. I uh, coordinated the Alliance for Toxic Free Fire Safety for many years, a national uh, alliance of groups concerned about flame retardant chemicals. And I was a member for eight years on the New York State Task Force on Flame Retardant Safety. Uh, next slide. So during that my time uh, working on state level advocacy, I worked to ban uh, Penta and Octa BDE and create the task force on which I subsequently served to explore availability of safer cost and performance effective alternatives to DECA BDE. I also led the work to pass uh, the first in the nation ban on TCEP, a carcinogenic chlorinated tris in New York State. New York was the first to take action on that chemical and subsequent expansion of that law, the Tris Free Children and Babies Acts to include TDCPP. Uh, that was in 2011 and 2014. I coordinated the Alliance for Toxic Free Fire Safety, and during that time, I helped shepherd federal uh, DECA BDE phase out, significant market shifts away from these uh, flame retardant chemicals and several state level bans. And I was one of the two advocates with the New York State Professional Firefighters Association that served on the uh, task force on flame retardant safety. Next slide. And uh, states have taken many actions on uh, flame retardant chemicals. Since 2004, 12 state states have passed 29 chemical-specific, product-specific flame retardant chem bans. Not comprehensive. They're specific chemicals, specific product sectors. It's w worth noting that each passed with firefighter support and despite rabid chemical industry opposition. So it, uh, it, they did not enter into these bans lightly, in other words. That was, uh, you know, well considered by the states that took action. And it, it seems to be growing, a momentum that's growing. Uh, next slide. In, now in 2015, 14 bills were introduced in 10 states in just one year alone to address uh, the hazards of these chemicals. And it's likely that in 2016, more policies will be introduced, and some of them will pass and become law. Next slide. But, you know, state actions only go so far, and that's why, of course, we are urging the uh, federal government to take action on this class in these products. Uh, only specific consumer products, upholstered furniture, children's products for age three and under, um, still a whole lot that would be covered, with, like electronics, for example, with this uh, um, action, this petition. And some of the states have acted several times because chemicals get replaced with another harmful chemical, and then that one has to be phased out. TDCPP was a replacement for TCEP, which was a replacement for Penta in uh, upholstered furniture. So we could do this forever. Uh, you know, there's 80,000 chemicals in commerce, and really, I mean, in many respects, the chemical industry is just sort of laughing at us and going, yeah, yeah, have your cute little one chemical ban because we're just going to go right to the next chemical. We're just going to go and tweak the molecule ever so slightly, and we're back in business. And it's less well tested and uh, not regulated at all. So the replacement chemicals are much less tested, as I said. So we're on a toxic treadmill with no end in sight. And the CPSC could fix this inadequate chemical by chemical approach. Next slide. Um, during that process, the, that year, those years, around 20, 
2004, 2005, when a number of states were passing these PBD bans, they, many of them set up task forces to examine DECA, which was the uh, most widely used of those three PBD chemicals. And uh, what's, what's different about New York State's department uh, task force was that it was a stakeholder process, so the chemical industry was represented on the panel. And that's why our uh, task force report took eight years, as opposed to the one or two years that the other government, solely government representative task forces took. Because they argued every, every dotted I and cross T and deferred and delayed until, in fact, DECA was uh, phased out by the EPA uh, domestic production. Next slide. So all of the, uh, thank you, all of the uh, task force uh, findings were that, in fact, there were safer uh, cost and performance effective alternatives to DECA. They all found the same thing. Uh, next slide. Uh, now it, there is proof that uh, the use of flame retardants does continue in the product sectors that this petition uh, works to address. Self-reporting by uh, sofa, mattress, and uh, carpet padding manufacturers shows that Yes, there are still, they're still using and adding the additive flame retardants. And I'm going to skip 9 and 10 and just go to 11. Uh, the Washington State use reporting is, uh, shows that these chemicals are 217 times in uh, three and a half years flame retardant chemical use in children's products was reported. Self-reporting by the companies that are adding them to their products. In uh, baby cars, car seats, booster seats, soft toys, baby swings, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, Ms. Curtis, your time has expired. I'm going to extend an Thanks. additional I'll 30 just give seconds. My conclusions. Thank okay. you so much. Um, so my conclusions are that state actions to ban certain flame retardants, while important, are not enough to avoid exposure and protect public health. We need your help. Uh, state task force reports clearly show there are alternatives to halogens that are affordable, available, and effective. And additive flame retardants are still being reported in upholstered furniture, mattresses, infant and toddler products, and electronics, the four categories covered under the petition request. So for these reasons and those stated by other supporters today, Clean and Healthy New York strongly supports prohibiting the sale of products that contain halogenated flame retardant chemicals. Thank you very much. Mr. Gerhardt? Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Gerhardt. I'm the research director at the Ecology Center. I'd like to thank the uh, commission for considering this petition on rulemaking on organohalogen flame retardants. The Ecology Center is a 45-year-old uh, regional environmental organization with offices in Detroit and Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, in addition to our core environmental work, we've worked for decades to reduce worker exposures to chemical hazards and improve occupational health and safety for manufacturing workers. Our organization staff are members of UAW Local 138 in Region 1A in Southeast Michigan. For the last eight years, we've conducted extensive consumer product research. We've actually tested over 15,000 products in the small lab that we actually operate as part of our organization. This work has identified a range of chemical hazards, including organohalogenated flame retardants, and a wide range of products, including toys, children's products, consumer electronics, vehicles, jewelry, outdoor products, and even pet products. A number of those categories are subject to this petition. Many of the chemical hazards we have identified, as was discussed earlier, are actually semi-volatile chemicals, additive chemicals, which are released from products throughout their life cycle, including, importantly, both the production phase, the use phase, and the end-of-life phase, including disposal and recycling of these products. So today I want to highlight uh, two important issues for you in my testimony that I don't think have been covered yet. Uh, first, I wanted to give an illustrative example of how product manufacturers are actually currently moving away from organohalogen flame retardants. And this really echoes Tim Riley's testimony from the previous session on the availability of non-halogenated uh, flame retardants in the marketplace right now. We have solutions that are on the shelf that are ready to go. This can be done. Uh, second, I want to summarize some of our more current research, which is increasingly showing that organohalogenated flame retardants contained in post-consumer plastics, particularly from electronics and electronic casings, are being recycled into new products and reintroducing these hazards to the economy. 
In terms of manufacturing practices, I have personally engaged with manufacturers of all different sizes, ranging from large Michigan companies like Ford and Steelcase to many smaller children product manufacturers. And we've had dialogues with them about green engineering approaches to design, how do we design out the need for using these flame retardants. In our experience, and for the reasons cited in this petition, we, we see many leading manufacturers are already moving to eliminate organohalogenated flame retardants. I just want to offer one company as an example because we've published their story already. Uh, Britax is a company which produces strollers and children's car seats. Mm -hmm. And while car seats are not directly subject to this petition, I think their story is nonetheless illustrative of the types of changes in product design that we're seeing uh, in response to the environmental health and, cons and consumer concerns, the company has steadily worked to improve the hazard profile of the materials used in their car seats and has become an industry leader. How have they done this? Two things. One, material substitution. Uh, car seats have a p expanded polystyrene foam in them for uh, shock absorption. It's poly polystyrene foam has the flame retardant HBCD in it. They've switched from a, a polystyrene foam to expanded polypropylene foam and eliminated the need to have the HBCD foam, uh, flame retardant in the product. The other thing they've done is a chemical restriction with their suppliers. They, as of January 1, 2013, Britex has required all of its suppliers to eliminate chemical flame retardants containing bromine, chlorine, and other halogens from all components that are in their car seats and other products. And this still is ensuring they can meet flammability standards to which car seats are still subject to. Um, so this is just a brief example showing what's going on in the marketplace. Second point I want to highlight is the increasing presence of the organohalogen flame retardants in recycled plastic feedstock. Uh, this is an avoidable reintroduction of flame retardants to the marketplace, which can be addressed through restrictions on organohalogen flame retardants through, like you're considering today, and through better supply chain management. Uh, we have a uh, extensive paper that summarizes uh, a set of data we have on uh, over 1,500 consumer products from 2012 to 2014 and looks at flame retardant trends in those uh, that I can submit to the committee. I know, I know I'm a little short on time, so I, I think I, I, I'll skip that part of this. But uh, the, the other item I do want to mention, because I think uh, there was some discussion of, of phthalates in the previous panel, and, and we've been very active on, on the phthalate issue as well and have been engaging with top retailers of flooring Home Depot, Lowe's, Lumber Liquidators, Floor and Decor, and many others. And I would just make one point in that as we talk to them about eliminating phthalates from their flooring, their approach was to approach this as eliminating ortho phthalates, not eliminating the CPSC list of phthalates, but they have really taken an approach to look at phthalates as a group of chemicals. Mr. Gerhardt, your time's expired. I'm going to grant you an additional 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, so I think the phthalate example is interesting to talk maybe a little more about. Um, so to conclude, my experience is that innovative manufacturers are ready and able and willing to eliminate the use of organohalogen flame retardants. However, CPSC leadership is critical to provide a uniform level, clear playing field that can impact the entire marketplace. I thank you for your time and look forward to any answering any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. McGannon. Uh, th thank you. Uh, my name is Brian McGannon. I'm the policy director for the American Sustainable Business Council. Thank you for the opportunity today to present in support of the petition. The American Sustainable Business Council advocates for policy that supports a more sustainable economy. The council spans a growing network of businesses and business associations across the United States, which in turn represents over 200,000 businesses and 325,000 uh, business executives, owners, investors, and others. Of the many issues that create a sustainable economy, toxic chemical reform is and has been a top priority for our organization. We've been active at the federal and state act advocacy in this space and have mobilized businesses through our Companies for Safer Chemicals project. The focus of my comments will be that the business community supports this, this petition in restricting halogenated flame retardants, and our, the companies are demonstrating that businesses can succeed, if not thrive, without using these toxic chemicals. Let me start with some broad perspective. ASBC commissioned a national scientific polling of small business owners. Some of these key findings include 73% of small business owners support government regulation to ensure that products companies buy and sell are non-toxic. 94% of those surveyed agreed that the companies using chemicals of concern to he human health should disclose their presence to customers and to the public. 
So there is a clear concern in the small business community about toxics and products and that they are by and large supportive of government regulation to restrict the risks posed by these chemicals. To put it in more practical context, I'd like to share uh, with you some examples of how some of the ASBC members are succeeding without using toxic flame retardants. Ohio-based Naturepedic manufactures crib mattresses without chemical flame retardants. When Natu uh, Naturepedic produces a mattress, the company ensures it meets all safety standards, such as proper firmness and fit, and provides fire protection and waterproofing. Through research and exploration, the company found it could meet its goals using food-grade polyethylene because of its lower flammability pro uh, properties. Polyethylene foam, through design and engineering, allows their mattresses to pass flammability tests without using flame retardants. Consumer demand for the company's products have led to rapid growth of the company, whose products are now found in hundreds of stores nationwide. New Jersey-based Hackensack University Medical Center is a leader in the growing hospital community who are, in their words, detoxing healthcare. A key component of this strategy is to ensure that all materials and products brought into the medical center have been screened for the, uh, for the use of ha hazardous chemicals that pose a threat to the health of patients, staff, and the community environment. To that end, uh, last year they stopped purchasing furniture treated with toxic flame, uh, flame retardants. Besides the health aspects of this move, benefits of this approach include reduced disposal cost and reduced liability. And last, California-based Futon Shop state that their fastest growing product segment in their 12 stores is their natural fiber flame retardant free mattresses. So in summary, informed consumers are changing the marketplace and businesses are innovating to meet the demand for cleaner and safer products. Institutional purchasing decisions are also helping change the marketplace. And businesses support uh, restricting the flame retardants that we're talking about today and already uh, are, are succeeding uh, without their use voluntarily, uh, but this petition uh, could help that for the entire marketplace. Thank you so much, and sorry to make everybody talk so quickly. You've all done a, mar a marvelous job, and it's extremely impressive. Um, uh, Ms. Weintraub, I'm just going to make a quick observation, at least from my perspective, and I'm only speaking for myself. Uh, when I look at the Federal Hazardous Substances Act, I don't see any legal impediments to a broad approach, a categorical approach. But the big issue is not going to be the legal issue. It's going to be the scientific issue, and that's one that I'm so delighted to have all of the testimony here about. But what I wanted specifically to ask you about as one of the petitioning groups is, uh, first of all, you limited your petition to four product categories. Is that telling us that those are the only four product categories that we should worry about with respect to these organohalogens? Um, not necessarily. I think um, we thought about our scope very carefully so that it would be as narrowly tailored as possible um, in contrast to what ACC is saying about the petition. So I think we thought about the categories um, that are best supported by the evidence that we know of, both in terms of um, use as well of ex as exposure. And I would note that the Commission independently will have to assess the scope of it should we grant the petition. We always have the option of expanding the scope or narrowing the scope so uh, but that's very helpful I guess the other question I would ask and I realize you're a lawyer not a scientist but I still wanted to ask that and that is um, we've heard uh, testimony about the need for FR chemicals in at least some of these products and I guess uh, as a starting point do we need uh, or these organohalogens in any of the four product categories uh, or to put it another way are any of the four product categories that are included uh, the types of products that need FR chemicals at all? And if so, can you tell me which ones absolutely would need some kind of an FR chemical? Um, first, I want to say that as a consumer organization that works on many issues, we are very concerned also about fire safety as well as consumer safety. So this is an issue that has been of great discussion in our organization. Um, and is there a balancing uh, of these risks to consumers? Um, I would say that for our view of the data is that it's unclear why um, fire deaths have been decreasing. It's a good thing, um, but we don't know why, and there's not clear evidence pointing to one particular reason. My hunch is that there are many reasons why. Um, but um, because of that, um, our view is that given um, two sets of hazards um, and the fact that there are other ways to fight against fires, um, you know, there are barrier methods, there are other things, and there are there are flame retardants that don't fall under this scope. So we think that there are other 
other ways and other things that can be done that would not necessitate the use of this class of chemicals in this in these four classes of products. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Huffling, uh, you raised an interesting point. Namely, you said a lot of your patients don't know which products are safe and which don't, so of mm -hmm. course they come and ask you. Uh, so I guess one question would be uh, that uh, in order to ban a product, we have to determine that labeling would be insufficient. I guess my question would be, do, would, it, would you be satisfied if we were just to require labeling for organohalogens? The problem I see is that if you tell me about a hazard but I can't get away from it, I'm not sure how helpful that is, but I'd be interested to hear what your take is on that. Uh, well, I, th I think just from what we've heard from other panelists today, um, I think with the health risks that are apparent with these flame retardants, I don't think labeling would would be enough. Um, you know, I'd prefer to prevent disease, and prevention would be that they're not available. Um, we've also seen with other products that when you have some of these more um, toxic ingredients, that those might be the ones that you find at like the dollar stores or some of these places where our lower income uh, patients are going to be shopping. And it, I think it's really unfair that they're the ones that already are facing burdens of disease from other areas of their lives, that they would be the ones most impacted. And I'd be very concerned that that could happen in this case. Uh, and just one quick uh, question, Ms. Curtis. Uh, most states don't like the feds <laughs> regulating because when we regulate, we preempt uh, state uh, in inconsistent state regulations. But this is one of those instances where you are actually looking to have the federal government take action rather than to have the states do it. And why is it you would suppose that we're better situated to do it than the states? Um, well, I, I first don't necessarily uh, think that in every instance the states would need to be preempted. I, I wasn't saying right. you were making so, that clear. You know, the, uh, and, or you could co-enforce yeah. would be another option. But, um, you know, we, are, we do care about kids in Wyoming and Indiana and p places where potentially there would never be uh, a law passed. So rather than, you know, limiting protections to the states that are able to lift that kind of legislation, we would want to protect children everywhere. Not to mention workers in other countries where most of the uh, products come from, and of course disposal communities, which are often communities of color and uh, low income as well. So, Thank you so much. My time's expired. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, and thank you all for coming here today. It's really important to all of us that you're here. Uh, Mr. Gearhart, let me just say that the Ecology Center, I love that it's in my home state of Michigan. Um, not only are we our center of industry, but one of the most beautiful states in the nation. So it's excellent. Um, so I, what I'd like to ask just quickly of uh, both you and Mr. McGannon, and let me just say how heartened I am to hear about the conscientious business effort to take toxic chemicals out of products. But do you think that if we were to grant this ban that it might spur innovation? I, I think the, the uh, uh, approach that w as uh, environmental health advocates that we've already taken to focus on halogens as a group of chemicals that we're talking with industry and manufacturers to getting out has already done that. I mean, we are spurring innovation. Um, you know, uh, the previous session talking about these new chemistries that are being developed, uh, these new green engineering approaches that are being developed to deal with stringent product standards, but doing it in a way that's healthier and safer. So, so yes, uh, it, it would help spur innovation. It would help reinforce the message that companies are hearing from the public health community, that they're hearing from states, uh, and that they're hearing from um, people around the world uh, on this issue. Um, I'll add to that that yes, I think the, 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 these would uh, spur innovation. That it, you know, in many ways. Government regulation acts as a signal to both investors and innovators who see that there will be a market, a potential market for a safer alternative. So, uh, you know, it'll tell investors, hey, this might be a safer play, or it at least gives them some guideposts that, hey, this is where we can, you know, uh, our money will, uh, will do the best work. Right. Thank you. Ms. Weintraub, you're the only petitioner on the panel, so I'm going to turn to you. And you brought up the EPA quickly at the end of your testimony. Um, we've been told today, as you know, that um, this work that we are talking about doing would be redundant because of what the EPA is doing. And uh, to use the words of one of the other witnesses, um, these substances that are under the petition, they say, have been and are being reviewed by the EPA. And they talk about 83 substances, 70 fire retardants, 50 fire retardants that have been found safe. Is that true when we're dealing with the specific substances that are under this petition? That is not true. 
Okay. Uh, do we know of any that specifically fall into this petition that the EPA has found to be safe? I don't believe so, no. Okay. And could you just speak briefly, because um, I, 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 we pointed out a little earlier that the EPA obviously is under one statute and they're dealing with industrial compounds and we're dealing with consumer products under the FHSA. Could you just speak briefly to what, what, what you would expect, um, what the, how this petition falls under our mandate under the Sure. FHSA? I mean, I think... Um, also, there's a huge effort to reform TSCA that for the past 40 years, I think there's pretty broad consensus that it hasn't been working. Um, and I think this petition is a reflection that we need the CPSC with their ath clear authority under the FHSA, with their expertise both in toxicology as well as in product safety to use their authority to take action when these chemicals are used in these four classes of consumer products. And when we're talking about the, uh, the FHSA, I know, know says that we can declare a substance to be hazardous, which is toxic if it causes substantial personal injury. Could you just talk uh, a bit about how what you're asking us to do in the, under the petition would fall under the FHSA? Sure. Um, well, under the FHSA, um, the trigger, as you said, is, is what is toxic and what is the hazard substance is linked to what is toxic. And the act um, is not very specific. It does not say what the risk is. It does not say a number. It does not talk about severity necessarily. Um, and courts have actually um, deferred to the CPSC in their interpretation. It could also be a capacity of harm. So it doesn't need to be a harm that has already been illustrated. So it is actually a, a broad term that courts have deferred um, to the CPSC to interpret the statute. And again, that's under the may cause substantial. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I'm a nurse, too. <laughs> and I'm from New York. <laughs> um, we may be related. Who knows? <laughs> um, thank you all very much for being here and for providing your testimony. I am very encouraged that without government regulation, without any uh, heavy hand of the federal government that there has been this much innovation and creativity among the manufacturers. That's good news. That's, that's uh, and I think as we wait, raise awareness, that will only continue. So thank you for that testimony. Um, Rachel, I just wanted to go back to, I should say Ms. Weintraub. It's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm from New York, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just want to um, go back to Commissioner Robinson's questions with regards to the EPA, because that issue came up this morning. Um, they, the panel before you, um, and I think it was ACC, the two um, panelists from uh, ACC, mentioned that although there was a list of chemicals that um, had, uh, EPA had come up with, they didn't see it. Now, you're, you testified to Commissioner Robinson that you didn't think these FRRs were in that list or covered by that list. But I'm so I'm asking, have you seen sure. that list? I, have, I have not seen the list. Um, and I am also not an EPA expert. There are others who will be testifying who are vastly more expert than I am. I have not seen the list. And my understanding is we don't know necessarily which um, FR chemicals are included and which are not included. So it may be that some are, it may be some are not. But you can't really say that it's redundant when we don't know what the scope of it and what the specific ingredients, chemical um, structures are. Good, and I think that's consistent with our, this morning's uh, panel that, you know, we really do need to see what is included in that list of chemicals. Um, I do want to ask, because you were a petitioner, um, do you have data to share on um, the, what you have in the petition to support the petition? I think that's a broad question. Um, we, we did provide a lot of scientific data. Um, certainly, I've filed numerous petitions before the agency. This petition had more data than any other <laughs> petition that I've ever filed, so we believe that we did. And in what you filed, did you see any gap <clears throat> between the animal and the human studies? Is there a gap? Is that of concern? Um, and not being a scientist, I would say there are other people um, who are better able to answer that specific scientific question. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Ms. Curtis, I want to go to your um, slide presentation. Um, and I believe it's the second to last slide that says Washington State reporting. And the first bullet that's there 
it says um, Washington State Children's Safe Product requires reporting, uh, the Safe Products Act requires a reporting list of 67 toxic chemicals in children's products, several of which are flame retardants. This kind of goes back to EPA, although we may have firsthand knowledge of what is included in that list, which are FRs, which are not. Do you have that information about yeah, what? Okay, that would be real helpful. I know it used to be 66 chemicals, and they added, they can add chemicals to the list through a, a petition process, and the one they added was CDC EPs, and that's why it's 67, so it's currently there. That's one flame card, and I know it was there. Okay, if you could provide us with that list, that would be real helpful. Thank you very much. And then, um, Mr. Gearhart, you referred to a study, and if you, um, I think you mentioned you were going to, but I just would ask for that for the record. Uh, if you could provide that to us, that would be extremely helpful. Yep, we'll do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all the panelists for their testimony and for the petition. And uh, Ms. Weintraub, I'm going to continue some of my exploration of the demand drivers for the incorporation of flame retardant chemicals in certain product sectors. If I could ask you to think about the electrical sectors, which I think we heard from testimony or general references to this, to UL94, does, uh, has CFA or will CFA engage in the voluntary standards uh, arena to encourage UL to withdraw uh, this small open flame uh, requirement in 94, which is seems to be driving a lot of the um, flame retardants and to pass that particular aspect in electronics generally? It's a good question. I, I'm not sure. Um, it's something that I actually have thought about and have discussed, but I'm not sure um, if we're going to be active there. Right. Do you believe that the CPSC should be active in that way to encourage UL to reconsider or withdraw that aspect of the, of the performance requirement of I, UL 94? I mean, I think UL would benefit from your expertise, certainly. Okay. And uh, how about on um, TB 117-13, do you believe the CPSC should adopt it as a national standard for upholstered furniture? Um, likely, yes. I'd like to do some more research before I commit wholeheartedly, but substantively, I think um, it likely would be a very uh, positive move forward. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Gerhardt, you um, identified a number of product categories, uh, and I don't think you were trying to be exclusive in your category, but I noticed you did not mention mattresses and the finding of any flame retardants that are uh, identified in the petition as being found in any uh, mattresses, and that, of course, is one of the product categories identified. Um, do, have you found uh, the existence of any in mattresses? Uh, our study sample set doesn't include a lot of mattresses. Very I think well. there's other um, studies that are referenced oh, in God. the in the petition and that we've talked about. So it's mostly other categories of, of consumer products. Thank you. Mrs. Curtis is jumping out yep. of her seat, and I was going there. <laughs> I was going there, too, Kathleen. Don't worry. Now, the, the International Sleep Products Association um, has provided written comments. I don't know if you saw that, but that's the, the, um, uh, the association that represents American manufacturers. And and they cite that they are unaware of any U.S. manufacturers that use organohalogen flame retardants to meet the requirements of 16 CFR parts 1632 and 1633, of course, our CPSC, flammability standards on open flame and smoldering. Um, now they said American, so it doesn't necessarily mean there couldn't have been imports. But uh, I noticed in your testimony you identified, and this is, this is, again, consistent with me looking at the demand drivers and mattresses. So that's why um, your testimony identifying four, um, four, four manufacturers that, um, that, that, that you found to have flame retardants in them. Can you explain the testing? They, they, we didn't, this is not testing. This is a market survey. We asked them. You How asked. do you achieve these flammability standards, and what do you use? So we asked them a series of questions, which I can provide for the uh, commissioners. And uh, yes, five reported being ca ca flame retardant chemical free, four reported flame retardants in foam, one disclosed avoiding specific flame retardants, mm -hmm. but wouldn't assert that they were flame retardant free, and one had two brands that were flame retardant free and two brands that were not flame retardant free. And this sort of fly, flew in the face of our conventional wisdom that we had thought in mine. 10 years ago that they had gone to these Kevlar sort of barrier um, technologies and had stopped using flame retardants. So that was interesting and new information mm -hmm. even for uh, advocates. And um, yeah, so 
Have you had any follow-up from those four that self-reported in some way? Uh, and how did they, how did they self-report? Was this a survey that was sent back in? They sent back MSDS sheets or BOM sheets to be able to identify you know, bill of materials, et cetera? It varied. We, these are, by the way, the top 14 domestic mattress makers. Okay. So we, it doesn't capture the entire universe, but, you know, the biggest ones. So together they do represent a very significant portion. Are you at domestic. liberty to identify the four? Uh, right this minute? Sure. Hang on a second. Can you come back to me? Sure. Okay. Maybe I could offer those in, in QFRs. Do, do any of the four um, subsequently, uh, have they provided any follow-up to refute that or perhaps that? No, this is their self-reporting. Their self-reporting. We, uh, what we, the market survey was designed yeah. to determine what the average person could find out. Not right. somebody that's very versed Understood. in these issues. That's a right to know perspective. You wanted to buy a mattress. You heard yeah. about this flame retardant stuff. You're like, gee, Sealy, do you use, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Tempur-Pedic, whatever. Right. And so if you called their customer service, what could right. you find out? If you, call, if you went on their website, what could you find out? Okay. Or if you did a Google search, like what had their statements had those companies made? But then we followed up with by sending them a subsequent letter and saying, here's what our market research showed. Is it, please feel free to refine or, or confirm or deny that. And so... And no responses to that. Well, we, yeah. got, we did get responses, but there were a, a percentage that did not respond. That's Thank correct. you very much. Well, I appreciate okay. it. Time has expired. I want to thank all the members of the panel again for speaking so quickly and speaking so <laughs> thoughtfully. Uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break, which by my watch takes us to 2.24. So we're to panel six, and this is the last panel of the day, and we have four speakers who are here and two speakers who will be with us uh, by telephone. Uh, the speakers who are here, Dr. Vito Babrowskis, and welcome to him. I've seen him before. Uh, Dr. Do Donald Lucas from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Dr. Jennifer Sass from National Resources Defense Council, Mr. Daniel Rosenberg from NRDC as well, and Dr. Holly Davies, Washington State Department of Ecology, and uh, I left out uh, Dr. Vina Singla, who is also here on, by way of phone. Dr. Bob Raskis, would you please uh, present your testimony? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Vito Braskis. I'm an independent fire safety scientist, but I also like to see myself as a responsible citizen of planet Earth. And so that is the context of my comments. Next, please. So just a little bit of preliminary note. I think you already heard this, that uh, are flame retardants effective or not effective? It depends on the ratio of FR chemical to the volume of flames that are present. That's what all the literature shows. And that is often the reason why you get fooled with testing results, because there will be a test result from a Bunsen burner type test, show glorious outcome. There'll be a real life uh, scenario, and that'll be seen to be ineffectual. That's been an especial concern for those of us involved with the upholstered furniture issue because the state of California in the prior standard had been testing the foams with a tiny flame in their test, whereas that's not the real life situation. The only reason why foam would get ignited is because of a burning fabric, and when a fabric ignites and burns, you get big flames and not small flames. Next. So are, are there any benefits to uh, putting flame retardants specifically of the uh, a organohalogen type that we heard uh, about earlier into these categories of products. Next, please. And, of course, smoldering and flaming. And we uh, talked a great deal in the, my prior presentation at uh, CPSC on upholstered furniture. I talked a great deal about the, the issues there. Next. Now, the, uh, what we can see is that uh, smoldering, for specifically for furniture, uh, while it has reduced greatly, still remains a significant problem. Uh, flaming ignitions, I would describe as being a de, at a de minimis uh, situation. That yes, they do occur, they are tragic, but it is doubtful that effective strategies can be mounted to uh, overcome that. Next. We're, we're, I think we already uh, covered that well enough. Next. 
Now, uh, this is something where uh, the hopefully the uh, commissioners will be apprising themselves of that. There's the industry has made a great deal of uh, advertising material based on inappropriate and misleading interpretations of a study that I was a lead author of whilst I worked at NIST in 1988. And uh, I ran tests which essentially replicated earlier tests that Hill and Brandon Ray ran for NASA of NASA type configurations. And indeed when you do that you can see some very interesting outcomes and you see an extreme peg stop situation of what can happen. However, that is not ever going to be a scenario that plays out in your living room. Uh, you will not be reading an FR version of the Sunday New York Times while wearing your FR slippers and your FR pajamas. That is just not uh, <laughs> going to happen. So the uh, a density, of the foam was different, the FR content uh, was much higher, et cetera. Next. The, when I had earlier tested uh, the furniture with consumer amounts of uh, retardants, lo and behold, we saw that there's absolutely, uh, totally ineffective situation, and that was well documented. The industry does not like me to bring that up. Next. Uh, next. The uh, risk of ignition of external candles or other such devices into casings of electronics uh, is minimal despite these very nice fires that Dr. Blaze showed and that I had an opportunity to do in my own career. Yes, I can make very nice fires. Statistics do not bear out that that is a uh, relevant way of testing. Next, please. Statistics, in fact, show that there is not a problem in Europe where they don't use these compared to America. Next. Same way in deaths as opposed to uh, fire incidents. Next. No benefit in children's uh, uh, products, uh, obviously, for pretty obvious reasons. Next. Now, this is something, again, people don't like to show, but I'm one of the few people who has published this particular graph. You can see a 100-year track record. You can see a steady decline. The industry has been telling you things that, oh, well, since we introduced these flame retardants in the 1950s, that you have had a, uh, some beneficial effect. I do not believe that is at all the case. I do believe that there is one overriding reason that explains that graph, and that is the increasing level of literacy and education. I believe that better explains than anything else why we have had a monotonic decrease uh, in that curve. Next. And uh, same way in California, uh, the California did not achieve a super abundant decrease uh, compared to the rest of America when they introduced their 1975 regulation. Next. Uh, so I, I support what the conclusions that you've seen before, and uh, I point out that uh, you got to be very careful about bench scale laboratory tests because they're likely to mislead you rather than help you. Next. Uh, Vito, you. your time has expired. I'm going to grant you an additional 30 seconds. And I am going to use the 30 seconds to thank the chairman and the commissioners. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lucas. Thank you. Um, my name is Donald Lucas. I'm a combustion researcher at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, the University of California, Berkeley. I specialize in toxic combustion byproducts. I was a deputy director of the Environment, Health, and Safety Division at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. I'm also on the advisory committee for the California Bureau that issued TB 117 2013. Next slide. So the science of chemistry and the question of why are we grouping some of these chemicals together. So I was going to bring my organic, organic chemistry textbook, which is exactly how we group things together, but the weight of it was going to exceed my uh, limit for uh, <laughs> carrying on the airplane. But if you look at it, you'll see that one of the reasons why we group chemicals together is because of their functional groups and their backbone. In the case of the organ gallohalogens that we're talking about, it's the backbone is the same and the functional groups are the same, and that's why they do belong together. Next. For example, the, all the non-polymeric organohalogens are semi-volatile, have an environmental persistence, preferred partitioning and fats, potentially increased chemical reactivity, having to do with toxicity. They produce halogen atoms at high temperatures, and they, they all produce impurities and combustion byproducts and dioxin furans when they are burned. And again, 
Fire retardants do not make things flame proof. They just can change the, the properties, but they will burn. I do want to point out uh, one of the questions came up earlier about TBPA not being part of this class because of the toxicity. And I was informed that Dr. Lin Linda Birnbaum has been doing research recently on this, and I hope the commission has some of her recent results, and if not, we'll be sure to get them to you. Next slide. So one of the questions is about the uh, when these compounds burn, what happens? And so when you burn an organohalogen, you can increase the toxicity, increase the amount of smoke, and increase the amount of nanoparticles that are formed. It's an emerging area of fire safety and, and combustion research, uh, and in addition to gases like HCl. So we know that's the case. What is interesting is when I talk to some of my colleagues at Louisiana State University who are world experts in the formation of dioxins and furans, they, they don't know anything about fire retardants, but I told them what I was doing, and I showed them the chemical structures of the organohalogen flame retardants that are being, they were extremely surprised that these were being used as flame retardants, because what they said is, these are great precursors to form more toxic products. I also do want to mention one thing about environmental persistence, and we talked about that uh, as being one of the similarities of, of these organohalogens. So now are we talking about consumer products that are in use now, or that have been produced in the last 20 or 30 years with these chemicals in there that are being produced now, but the fact that these compounds can last for generations. And when we throw them away, if we put them in a landfill, we're now passing on a problem. They will eventually break down. We're not even sure the mechanism of the breakdown or the breakdown products, and then we suspect that in many cases these are going to be toxic products. So one of the things we have to worry about, I would hope the Commission does, is not just worry about the exposure to consumer products now, but what about the exposure that's going to be generations down the line from these products? Next slide. Um, the organohalogens, as Vito mentioned, it, the testing is very difficult to, to duplicate real fires. They're very complex. You try to design the test. One of the reasons is to make it easy to do in the laboratory so you can do it in a repeatable way, but it doesn't cover every single fire scenario. So I think that it's, as Vito mentioned, it's very hard to go from a fire test to real fire data. And I wish the fire data had the same scrutiny as does the toxicity data. You know, you'll have hundreds of studies on toxicity and everyone's arguing about the effect, how big it is, yet the fire data seems to be taken for, for granted as being the truth. And I think there's a lot of work. I know the IAFF is working on that, looking at some of the issues involved the reporting of the fires and what's going on. We heard Dr. Blaze say that the fire retardants had to prevent fires from small flames, but not the big ones. So when you have a big fire, things are going to burn. What about small fires? Well, here's a picture of a um, sofa in the UK from Dr. Richard Hall. And what it, the ignition source here is four sheets of newspaper. And I should point out that in the UK, the fire standards are even greater than in California. And they have this sofa has more fire retardants in it than the sofa is typical in the U.S. So with four sheets of newspaper lit by a match, the entire sofa and the room was consumed. So I don't know if you consider that a big fire or a small fire, but the idea that a, it only prevents big fires or big fires are going to burn anything, but small fires will be prevented by the FRs, I don't think is true. Next. So my uh, conclusions are that the inherent properties of these organic, organic flame retardants do, do pose human health hazards. They fail to offer meaningful fire protection, but they can increase fire toxicity, and that re re regulating them as a class makes scientific sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Sass? Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, and present these comments supporting the petition by Earth Justice. And the petitioners um, asking to declare that the certain products are banned hazardous if they contain non-polymeric additive organohalogen flame retardants. I'm a senior scientist at NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. I've been with them for 15 years and I've worked on toxic materials and federal regulation that whole time. I'm also a professorial lecturer at George Washington University in the School of Public Health. In addition, like most of you, I'm also a parent and a consumer um, and I have a dusty home. And I come to you as someone in all of those roles today. I've carefully reviewed the excellent scientific statements by the petitioners and supporters in the petition and the policy implications of the petition. Uh, 
I'm very alarmed, actually, when I read through it, by the overwhelming evidence um, for some members of the organohalogen class of chemicals to have adverse effects on systems that are critical to normal human development and function. Um, the, my full statement has more details, and of course the petition has more details, um, but many of these studies over the last 10 years um, are um, very um, disturbing. Rather than wait for an overabundance of proof of harm before taking action for all of the other non-polymeric additive organohalogen flame retardants, CPSC should act on the petition to address all of the chemicals in this class at once. What level of proof should be required? to address the chemicals for which little or no hazard information is available. It should be the level that supports regulatory decisions that prevents harm. For the class of organohalogen flame retardants, the work of Dr. Eastman and colleagues, which is attached to the petition, demonstrates that there are sufficient data, either by individual chemical testing or by applying standard read-across techniques to show that the whole class is hazardous and may cause substantial personal injury or illness. His laboratory screened about 90 organohalogen flame retardants, about 85 of which were non-polymeric. The team used standard search strategies to identify publicly available toxicity data on all chemicals, including published studies, government databases, industry data submissions, and uh, ECHA, the European Chemical Assessment Regulations. These are the same, and, and others, these are the same kind of standard uh, literature searches that are done by US EPA, Health Canada, and the European regulatory agencies. Um, using these same uh, databases, and the information is uh, considered reliable. For cases where information was lacking, his team used standard um, QSAR, quantitative structure activity relationship models, that are also publicly available in the OECD toolbox, um, the QSAR toolbox, which is online. The toolbox is specifically designed to serve this gap filling function and is used by state and federal regulatory agencies, industry, academic researchers and others that must conduct chemical um, hazard assessments of new and existing chemicals with incomplete data sets. When using these tools, it's standard practice to group the chemicals according to their structure. Substances with little or no data are grouped with those substances that share the same or similar structure and have more robust data sets. His team did this um, appropriately. It's very concerning that when he did do this, he found that most of the organohalogen flame retardants still lacked enough basic information to actually run them through a green screen, which is a standard hazard assessment screen used by EPA um, state regulators and others. These are screening um, tools that are designed to use minimum data sets. Um, so with even less than that to go on for some cases, um, he applied a standard screening tool um, used by Washington State Department of Ecology called QCAP. And what he found was that all of the non-polymeric organohalogen flame retardants that were screened um, were found to be either of high concern or toxic based on the criteria as described above. And the results of the screen showed that critical tox data were lacking for many of them, and those for which data were available posed significant hazards for um, people or the environment. Given how little is known about these, if CPSC fails to include all of these in a ban, then it will be as if those chemicals that have not been tested are presumed to, are presumed to be non-toxic, and this is clearly wrong, as Eastman's work shows. The NRC in its Science and Decisions 2009 report said agents that have not been examined sufficiently in epidemiologic or toxicologic studies um, are insufficiently included in or even excluded from risk assessments um, oftentimes. They were concerned about this, that typically there's no description of the risk potentially posed by these agents and risk characterization, so their, um, their risk or their toxicity ends up carrying no weight um, in the final decision ma making. And this is a problem that's addressed in this petition. So, thank you. Uh, excellent timing, Dr. Sess. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Rosenberg. <clears throat> Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to pres present my testimony in support of the petition. My name is Daniel Rosenberg. I'm a senior attorney in NRDC's Health and Environment Program. Uh, we urge the Commission not to be dissuaded from granting the petition on the ground that action taken by EPA in the past, present, or future pursuant to the Toxic Substances Control Act, TOSCA, is now or will be sufficient to render action by the Commission redundant. 
Uh, Tosca divides chemicals into two broad categories, existing chemicals and new chemicals, which are treated somewhat differently under the law. However, the law does not give EPA adequate authority to properly evaluate and regulate either category of chemical, which is why Tosca is widely recognized as the greatest failure of the major environmental and health laws passed in the 1970s. Most chemical substances covered by Tosca are considered to be existing chemicals, meaning that they were available for use in commerce at the time Tosca was enacted in 1976. These existing chemicals, roughly 62,000 of them, were grandfathered and were not required to meet any safety standard at that time. The law makes it very difficult for EPA to require testing of these existing chemicals, and as a result, EPA estimates that it has required full testing for only 200 to 300 of the 62,000 substances. Tosca also makes it very difficult for EPA to restrict the use of an existing chemical. The burden of proof is on the EPA to demonstrate that the substances pose an unreasonable risk to human health or the environment, and that the proposed restriction is the least burdensome necessary to address the risk. To date, EPA has only successfully restricted the use of about a half dozen of the 62,000 chemicals that were grandfathered. As the commissioners likely know, in 1989, EPA unsuccessfully tried to ban most uses of asbestos, a known human carcinogen. When a federal court ruled that EPA had not demonstrated that EPA had, that the agency, excuse me, had adopted the least burdensome regulation necessary. That court decision was in, in, was in 1991, and EPA has not yet attempted to restrict the use of another existing chemical. Beyond the roughly 62,000 chemicals grandfathered as existing, another roughly 22,000 substances have entered the market via the new chemicals program of Tosca. EPA's new chemicals program should not be assumed to have effectively prevented unsafe chemicals, including flame retardant ingredients, from reaching the market. Tosca limits the type of information that EPA can require upfront as part of a pre-manufacturing notice, or PMN. As a result, EPA estimates that nearly 70% of all chemical applications EPA receives, the PMNs, contain no data on health or environmental effects. While EPA has some procedural mechanisms to hold up approval of a new chemical until a consent agreement is reached to require additional testing, they are, infrequently, they are used infrequently by EPA. And even with the, me the methods EPA has developed to screen new chemicals in the absence of a basic set of data for new chemicals, problematic new chemicals do slip through the cracks. EPA estimates that it receives substantial risk reports from industry on about 30 chemicals each year that previously went through the new chemicals program, and this likely underestimates the problem. It is these structural problems with the new chemicals program under Tosca that contributed to the GAO, Government Accountability Office's, placement of EPA's chemical program on its list of government programs at high risk for failure in 2009. That, it's still on that list uh, six years later. And led the EPA Inspector General to conclude in 2010 that claims about the new chemicals program ensuring the public is protected from unreasonable risk are, quote, not supported by data or actual testing. Um, in short, assurances from stakeholders interested in avoiding regulation or restriction of their products that the Tosca program is taking care of any safety concerns and that there is no reason for CPSC to act should be ignored by the Commission. Uh, nor, how am I doing on time? Two minutes. Two minutes. Nor should the Commission refrain from acting based upon the potential for revision to Tosca by con revisions to Tosca by Congress. In the first place, adoption of Tosca reform legislation is not a certainty, and the Commission should, do not, should not delay action to protect the public based on the possibility that Congress might take care of the problem by legislating changes to Tosca. Second, even if Tosca legislation is at some point enacted, it will not quickly address and may never address the concerns that are at the heart of the petition. There is no guarantee that a revised Tosca, even when the revised program is up and running, will ensure that EPA will be able to effectively and timely regulate articles or products containing either existing or new flame retardant chemicals or the chemicals themselves. Um, based upon legislation that is currently under consideration, in some respects, EPA's ability to regulate products or articles, as they're called in their Tosca, containing chemicals of concern could be made more difficult, including making it harder for EPA to require notice of potential new uses of chemicals of concern in imported products. Ultimately, whether or not Tosca is reauthorized and whatever EPA does or does not do in the coming years, the Commission has a mission and authority independent of and not subsidiary to that of EPA under Tosca. 
The existence of Tosca is not a reason or justification for the Commission to, to decline to use its own authority to protect the public from products containing these dangerous chemicals as outlined in the petition. The Commission should proceed with granting the petitioner's request and implementing the asked for ban to protect the public. Thank you again very much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Singla, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm about to ask the audience, can you hear Dr. Singla? Yes, the answer is. Please proceed. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment today. I'm a staff scientist with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Next slide. So I'm sure that you all know about the story of the scorpion and the frog. So a frog gives the scorpion a ride across a river, and the scorpion stings the frog, dooming them both. When asked why, the scorpion replies, well, it's in my nature. And I'm telling this story because it illustrates an important principle for our discussion, that like the scorpion, chemicals behave the way they do because it's in their nature. That is, a chemical's fundamental properties are dictated by its very makeup. And what I'm going to talk about is that for the additive non-polymeric organohalogen flame retardants used in certain consumer products, it's in their nature as a class to present risks to human health. Next slide. As Dr. Lucas mentioned, when considering whether chemicals can be grouped together as a class, there are four key criteria to look at. The structural similarity, the physical and chemical properties, environmental fate characteristics, and toxicity. Next slide. So one way to evaluate structural similarity is to look for a common fu functional group, as uh, Dr. Lucas also mentioned. Next slide. So what we're looking at here is the uh, group of acid chlorides that EPA's new chemicals program uses based on the functional group that's circled there in red. And the R in this picture stands for the rest of the chemical structure. And the rest doesn't matter here because it's the part that's circled in red that gives rise to the chemical properties of concern. Next slide. So all of the chemicals that are now shown on this slide are part of EPA's acid chloride group. Next slide. Even though these chemicals are all structurally distinct and do look very different, they all have the same functional group circled there in red, and thus they fall into the same class for evaluation. Next slide. So just like the class of acid chlorides shares a functional group, so do the organohalogen flame retardants. In this case, the functional group is the organohalogen linkage. That's the carbon bonded to chlorine or bromine that's circled in red. Next slide. So stemming from this organohalogen nature are two important shared physical chemical properties, the boiling point that make these chemicals semi-volatile organic compounds and hydrophobicity, meaning that they don't mix with water very well. Uh, on the other hand, fatty things are what they love to mix with, so they're lipophilic or fat-loving. Next slide. Now, because they're semi-volatile organic compounds, these flame retardants can exist in both a solid and gas state at typical room temperatures. They continuously transition from the solid to the gas state and migrate out of products. Now, because they're hydrophobic, the chemicals attach to particles in the air that are also hydrophobic. They're attracted to that like nature. And then finally, the contaminated particles settle into house dust. Next slide. The flame retardants can enter our bodies when we breathe in, touch contaminated dust, surfaces, or products, and accidentally get the dust in our mouth when we're eating. Next slide. Now, generally, there are few natural processes that can break this carbon-halogen linkage. So that means the chemicals are persistent indoors and outdoors. Indoor persistent Persistence means that once flame retardants migrate out of a product, they stick around and people are continuously exposed to that contaminated air, dust, and surfaces. 
bioaccumulation um, also stems from the physical chemical property of hydrophobicity. Because they're hydrophobic and fat-loving, organohalogen flame retardants partition from the environment into living tissues that contain fat. Next slide. So the fat-loving nature means that organohalogen flame retardants can easily cross into living cells. Uh, that's because the protective outer layer of a cell, the membrane, is made of faster lipids. Once they're inside cells, the flame retardants resist breakdown and are not removed from cells. The carbon halogen bond is a key feature that causes these molecules to evade the mechanism, those ABC transporters that were mentioned previously, that normally block and remove foreign chemicals from cells. And as Dr. Sass mentioned, Dr. Eastman's assessment of over 80 organohalogen flame retardants Dr. Singla, found that all the compounds studied present human health hazards. Dr. Singla, your time has expired, but you can have 30 more seconds if you wish. Uh, thank you. I will use those 30 seconds to um, thank the commission and say that based on the structural similarity of the common functional group, the shared physical, chemical, environmental fate, and toxicity properties, it's appropriate to group these flame retardants together as a class, and CPSC rulemaking is needed to protect consumers. Thank you so much. Dr. Davies, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear her? Yes. Please proceed. I'm Dr. Davies from the Washington State Department of Ecology, which is our state environmental agency, and I'm here today in support of the petition. My testimony will focus on information from Washington State on flame retardants, in consumer products, especially children's products, and the availability of safer alternatives. Our environmental monitoring has shown organohalogen flame retardants are widespread in Washington's environment, and we have one fish consumption advisory for PBDEs. The Washington State Departments of Ecology and Health investigated flame retardants in our 2006 Chemical Action Plan for PBDEs. In 2007, following the recommendation in the PBDE Chemical Action Plan, Washington passed a law restricting the use of PBDEs in certain products sold in Washington State. This was the first ban on DECA BDE and helped to inform a national agreement in 2009 between the manufacturers and EPA to stop producing DECA BDE. In 2008, Washington passed the Children's Safe Products Act. This requires manufacturers of children's products sold in Washington to report if their product contains a chemical of high concern to children. This reporting list contains five organohalogen flame retardants, DECA-BDE, TBBPA, TCEP, TDCPP, and HBCD. As of August, manufacturers have filed over 33,000 reports of a chemical in a product component and category. Only 33 reports were for halogenated flame retardants with the function of flame retardant. Most were at low levels, indicating they are likely present as contaminants. Only 11 reports indicated the chemical was used in the percent level. Ten of these were for TBBPA, and one of these reports was for DECA-BDE in outdoor play structures at the percent level. 118 reports noted that these five chemicals were present for functions other than flame retardant, including contaminants, colorants, or plasticizers. Only a small number were in the percent levels. There were 13 reports of TBBPA in the percent levels used as a colorant. I would like to note that we have not independently confirmed the presence of these flame retardants in these products, and manufacturers may report different functions or higher levels without penalty. The department has tested some consumer products for the presence of flame retardants to ensure compliance with our state laws. We tested for flame retardants in general consumer and children's products, including seat cushions, mattresses, upholstered furniture, electronics, clothing, and baby carriers. Our product testing indi results indicate that manufacturers have moved away from PBDEs and are using other organohalogen flame retardants. This supports treating organohalogen flame retardants as a group, as manufacturers are substituting other organohalogen flame retardants. The majority of samples that contained high levels of bromine did not contain PBDEs above detection limits. The presence of high bromine levels and low PBDE concentrations suggested alternative brominate flame retardants were likely used in the products. Further testing identified Firemaster 550 and 600, which are commercial mixtures containing organohalogen flame retardants. PDCPP was the most commonly identified chlorinated phosphate detected in foam, again indicating that alternative organohalogen flame retardants are being used. TCEP, TCPP, and V6 were also detected in foam, mostly in foam. 
TBVPA and HBCD were also detected in some samples at percent levels, indicating their use as additive flame retardants. Alternative assessments have identified safer alternatives to organohalogen flame retardants in the uses described in the petition. Alternative assessments are specific to a particular use of a chemical and ensure that safer alternatives are identified, which prevents regrettable substitutions. The 2007 Washington State ban on DECA BDE in residential upholstered furniture and electronic enclosures went into effect after the Departments of Ecology and Health determined there are safer alternatives for those uses. There are also several alternative assessments by EPA's Design for the Environment program. Ecology and Health determined that chemical flame retardants are not necessary in upholstered furniture. There are barrier fabrics or inherently flame resistant materials that meet fire safety standards for furniture. The Design for Environment program at EPA identified safer chemical alternatives for flame retardants also used in flexible polyurethane foam and furniture. Ecology and Health identified a safer alternative to DECA BDE in electronic enclosures, as did EPA's design for the environment. EPA has also found safer alternatives for HBCD used in expandable polystyrene foam for insulation. So in conclusion, organohalogen flame retardants are a class of chemicals that are toxic to humans in the environment and are found in indoor and outdoor environments as well as in people and wildlife. Additive organohalogen flame retardants are not needed in any of the uses mentioned in the petition because safer chemical and non-chemical alternatives exist for all the applications listed. The Washington State Department of Ecology recommends that you initiate rulemaking under the Federal Hazardous Substance Act to declare these products with additive organohalogen flame retardants be banned hazardous substances. Thank you. And thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Sass, if you uh, would, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, when I, you were testifying, I heard several words that I think could be taken out of context, like uh, we've got uh, data gaps, uh, minimal data sets, and you talked about how little is known. And so the saving grace for all of this is something that you referred to as read across techniques. And I was wondering if you could enlighten us in a second or two about how read across techniques can actually fill in the data gaps. Sure. So for um, this group of chemicals, um, for many of them, we, we do have the data. And, and like I say, that there's references in the petition, there's references in my comments, there's published papers, stuff like that. Um, but for some, we don't, and we're asking you to look at the whole group. So using standard techniques like read across means that you look at the structure of um, the chemical. You compare um, it to other chemicals with the same or similar structure that we know a lot more about. And there are standard methods and programs that help to to do that in standardized ways, um, and those tools are available publicly. Um, they're tools that are used by government, EPA uses them, governments use them, um, state level academics, um, and, and the, those, some of those agreed upon tools um, are used in the work that was presented in the petition. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Lucas, you talked about the environmental persistence of these chemicals, and it brought to mind what Dr. Balin was saying this morning, is that if you're a manufacturer that's using FR chemicals, you want them to be persistent. Could you explain why that's so? I'm, I'm not sure what persistent. I can explain why they want them to be persistent. Okay, well, but why would one want a chemical well, like I, that to I be would, persistent? I assume if, if you're using a chemical deliberately, you don't want it to start reacting in the product that you're making. But because they last such a long time, but if they don't last forever, they will eventually break down. And the lifetime of some of these compounds that we're talking about can be in the hundreds of thousands <clears> of years. Um, and I guess the question I want to make sure that I'm clear about, and that is Dr. Babroskis. Uh, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. That's why I keep calling him Vito. Uh, Do I understand that you are saying that with respect to the uh, organohalogens that are uh, at subject here that are in the four product categories, that they provide no useful benefit whatsoever and that uh, even if they were banned and they were, there were no FR substitutes, that the world would be a better place without them? That's my assessment, yes, that both the testing of appropriate quantities of the materials and appropriate fire tests and uh, all of our available statistical fire incident data do not support the existence of benefits. So that's the conclusion you have to draw. And I would ask, uh, is there any member of the panel, including Dr. Singler, Dr. Davies, who would disagree with the statement that was just made? 
Uh, well, thank you very much. And I guess I would ask uh, the panelists again of uh, this notion of regrettable uh, uh, substitutions. Could you explain why that is a dynamic here and why it is so important for this commission to pay attention to this, uh, this notion? And I throw it up to anybody who cares to speak to it. Um, I'm happy to say a few words, and um, I also know that Dr. Singla has done a lot of work in this area as well. Um, the problem is the regrettable substitution is substituting one harmful chemical for another. It's, it's um, particularly of concern where we're substituting a chemical whose harm we know because it's better studied for a chemical who, that is also harmful but just simply isn't as well studied. And so unfortunately, sometimes the chemicals, um, we don't look at them um, when they're in the dark. Um, we don't know much about them. We presume that they're not harmful, but they are, and we know they're harmful because of their structure and because of using these standard read-across methods. Um, and that's the concern we have if the Commission doesn't act on this petition to make a strong statement to ban all of these from these uses. Uh, thank you very much. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. Um, first, Dr. Lucas, let me just say that I share your frustration about the fire data and have for as long as I've been on the commission. My staff and I have worked very hard trying to improve that data. Um, the only place that we've been able to think of that you could improve that data is with insurance companies where presumably they do investigations with fire experts and come up with segregation claims if they exist. So if you come up with any ideas on how we might get that, we would love to have it. Because as soon as people came in and started or arguing things to me that were 180 degrees different based on the same data, I knew we had a problem. So I know we have that. But since we don't have um, better data than that, let me turn to... can I answer that? Yes. Uh, the... Uh, I had written an article two years ago on, on precisely this point, and which I'd be glad to send to you, that I do believe that there would be a perfect opportunity for the insurance companies to cooperate in the public benefit because without violating any antitrust relationships and without uh, compromising their um, uh, a, a customer base integrity, uh, what they could do is they could provide reports of these uh, a, analyzed fire causes as determined by experts much more intensively studied than the fire department personnel, which generally lack uh, a... Could we talk about this when it's yeah. not during my five minutes? Because I'd love to hear more. <laughs> but let me just turn for a moment. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I just, let me just turn for a moment to the question about the methodology, because I do understand that when you have a group of chemicals that have the structural um, similarities and physical and chemical uh, properties that we, that we look at and they're the same, um, and you have information about a few, and then you can m do the read across and come up with this grouping. But I also s understand I want to go to the next step, and I think that's either for you, Dr. Lucas, or for Dr. Singla. I would love to know if you know of any of these non-polymeric additive organohalogen fire retardants that would be in this group that's within the petition that have enough structural differences that we would expect a different end point. Not not being a health expert, I can't answer that question, but from a fire safety and fire uh, retardancy properties, they're all the same. Okay. Dr. Singla, do you have anything to add to that? Yes. I, I'd say that um, the read across can be applied in a number of different ways to understand the toxicity of the whole class. So um, first, there's the, the kind of fundamental physical chemical properties that predict the substance's tendency to be um, persistent by accumulative and enter living cells. And I would say that's a core um, attribute shared by the entire class. Um, but if you think about the kind of whole wide world of chemicals as a universe like ours, um, then that class of organohalogen flame retardants um, would be like a galaxy. And it's that fundamental organohalogen nature that holds it together. But then kind of within that galaxy, there's clusters of stars, and these are um, the clusters of chemicals that have additional structural similarities. And it's kind of within these clusters and between clusters that are close to each other um, that the read across can, um, again, be employed to uh, interpolate or extrapolate more specific information about the particular harms that a chemical can cause. Okay, and, and so to use your language... Uh, to my knowledge, there's... Sorry. No, no, go. I, I, I was just going to add that to my knowledge that there's, um, n there are not 
um, specific structural elements of this organohalogen class that would kind of exclude them from that galaxy. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me just ask one um, unrelated follow-up question to you, Dr. Um, Singla. Could you tell us what your, I, I know you've been listening to the testimony, and there's been testimony about the EPA having tested 50 chemicals and finding them safe. Could you tell us if you have any information on that? Yes, um, I think, I, I would say that I think the, the EPA would be the best source of information about that claim. But from conversations with the EPA, it's my understanding that that statement was made based on a screening assessment that they, that they performed. And the 50 flame retardants in question are polymeric flame retardants. And that's the criteria that they're, those were based on old criteria, and that the criteria that they're currently now using, um, they would not consider those as safe or safer. Okay, I'm in my last minute, so let me just ask you, Dr. Babruska, um, wh why was the fire in the TV not relevant? Uh, because the uh, statistics show that uh, in Europe they have not used the, uh, these halogenated FRs that we do, and the losses in Europe are, in fact, not higher but lower than ours. So that, obviously, in the real world, does not support that there's a, uh, a, a problem that occurs from a non-usage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all to our panelists and the two who are not here today uh, for your testimony and your help in shedding some light on this issue and this petition. Um, Doctor, I'm going to call you Dr. Vito. <laughs> I'll find the hap happy medium. Um, on one of your slides in your PowerPoint, you mentioned that, and the heading is, no meaningful fire safety benefit from additive FRs in electronic enclosures. None at all? Well, certainly, the, the, uh, a, that, that's why I think the distinction between testing that's not relevant to real life versus statistics from real life. The statistics from real life do not support that uh, America is safer than e Europe because we've been adding these uh, noxious chemicals and they haven't. Uh, they uh, instead show the opposite. So the, that is the only guideline that we have to go by for the real world at the moment, and that certainly does not support the industry's point of view. But the, and the problem I see, and we've kind of all acknowledged it here today, is the, is the issue of the data and information and whether it's reliable or not with regards to this information of, of the fire data. So it's, it's rather speculative because we don't know if the data that we have is accurate. And so... Um, well, yes, that, that, that is correct. And, but, you know, the, the thing to remember is that uh, there's, no, there's, no, there's no bias. Certainly we don't believe that uh, uh, NFPA or uh, a FEMA are biased in the way they collect and, and report the data. But uh, given that, the statistics do not support that any of these noxious chemicals have had a beneficial role. And that, I think, is a very important point. Um, and one last question, Dr. Vito. Um, you mentioned flaming number, the flaming number. So are you referring to small flame, open flame, or large open flame, or do you not make that well, distinction? The, uh, there's small open flames. There's not uh, very many that are in the category of large open flames being the first ignited item, and typically those would be in the incendiarism category, so that's automatically excluded. You know, somebody pours two gallons of gasoline and then lights it, that's, we don't consider in the profession that that's a preventable uh, type of uh, uh, incident. Thank you. Dr. Lucas, uh, in your testimony you talked about environmental persistence and how these chemicals can accumulate from one generation to the next. I, uh, this morning, Dr. Uh, Bloom um, talked about biochemical accumulation, and I think uh, Dr. Singla mentioned the same terminology. Would you say that those two are the same? Are they just different use, different terminology to describe the same yeah, I th well, one, one is just the accumulation up the food chain, but the other one is the fact that they will persist in a long period of time. So there's evidence now that even today, uh, some of these chemicals are migrating out of landfills, either by birds eating food, the things, moving it away, or actually in the leachate. 
And so we know that over, you know, landfills are not designed to last for 500 years. So we know eventually some of these chemicals are going to start breaking down and will become persistent in the environment. And so my question is, and I'll ask you the same question I asked Dr. Bloom, uh, is does this persistence, this environmental persistence that you're referring to, um, does that necessarily translate <coughs> to risk? I, I think it will because these chemicals are going to break down and one of the issues is what chemicals do they break down to and what is the toxicity of those chemicals. And there, I just heard a, a recent study about the debromination of some compounds. So from a relatively safe brominated compound to a lesser brominated compound. So the toxicity actually increased as these chemicals were in the environment. Do you have any data that you could provide to us on that? whether when there's an environmental persistence, how that translates to risk and exposure hazards? We'll get you that, yes. Thank you. Um, and I'm coming down to my last minute here, and so I guess I would ask, and this will probably be a follow-up question. So as I mentioned in an earlier panel today, we are looking at phthalates, and it's been mentioned here today. And what I've heard throughout the course of these panels is that the structure makes these chemicals very similar. But that's not what we're hearing when we talk about phthalates. And so my question to all of you is, what's the difference between the phthalates and these uh, chemicals that we're talking about today? Why in one uh, instance? Uh, pardon me, this, this is uh, Dr. Singla. If, um, if I could speak uh, to that question, I would say that there are many different ways that chemicals can be grouped that are all scientifically accurate, but what's important is um, that the grouping needs to be appropriate to answer the question at hand. So um, in the case of phthalates, the Chronic Hazard Advisory Panel needed to create a grouping for the task of a quantitative cumulative risk assessment of phthalates. And the group of five phthalates that they created was appropriate for that task and for that question but not necessarily for others. So, for example, the um, Biomonitoring California program lists all orthothalates as a group for biomonitoring, which is a far larger class than the five phthalates that the CHOP considered. But both these classes are scientifically accurate and appropriate for the purposes for which they were created. And um, here, we're with the organohalogen flame retardants, we're creating a class of substances for consideration um, of whether the substance may cause substantial um, injury or illness during or as a result of any customer, customary or reasonably foreseeable use, including um, foreseeable ingestion by children. So the characteristics that we're using to create this class of organohalogen flame retardants speaks directly to these criteria that the fact that human exposure will occur and that children are more vulnerable and that the substances are toxic and may cause harm. So I would say um, here the, the class of... Dr. Singla, I'm going to ask you to wrap and, that up. I've let you go a little bit longer because you don't have the same <laughs> clock that we do, but could you wrap your answer up, please? Thank you, Dr. Singla, and I probably will be following up with uh, your explanation. It's very helpful. Thank you. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the entire panel uh, for their participation uh, today as well as their testimony. Uh, Dr. Davies, uh, TBBPA, um, I'm interested in the conflicting evidence that we've heard today about TBBPA. Uh, is it correct that Washington State has listed TBBPA as a chemical of high concern to children? Yes. And your testimony reflect, I'm just going to quote, that TBBPA was detected in four plastic electrical enclosure components and the percent levels indicating that it was used as an additive flame retardant. So does anybody on the panel disagree that TBBPA is absolutely in scope for, the, for, this petition, for this petition based on the evidence provided by Washington State? Does anybody disagree? It is. Okay. So the, so the evidence with regards to TBBPA is relevant given the scope of the petition. Uh, Dr. Sass, you mentioned um, a screening activity that took place involving uh, many organohalogens, and I think your testimony concluded that all of them were found to be uh, unsafe or, or uh, however the, the screening failed. Uh, did that include deep, uh, TBBPA? 
I'm gonna, as far as you know. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to check okay. my notes to see if I wrote that down. But if not, I really have to refer to the attachment at the back of the petition. I'm sorry. It's quite uh, all right. And I do not have specifics in this testimony. I'm I put sorry. you on the spot about that. I mean, the reason I'm, I'm interested in this is because we've heard evidence in studies and some journals provided by, um, uh, by other testimony today about the safety of TBBPA. Um, would anybody want to uh, comment on that or how that, um, uh, or have you read any of those and you found that, you found that the, the arguments were not valid? I mean, could it be debunked in any way? I would just like Thank you. make a comment because not being a toxicologist, but being a, you know, a scientist, the number of research papers about PBDEs and their toxicity is continuing to increase today. And so it, they were introduced in the 70s and there was very little research and it took 30 years to get to the point where we have enough data amassed that it's, it's a well discovered fact that yes, they have you know, toxic properties. So when you bring in a new chemical, it looks like the research mm -hmm. on the toxicity can lag the introduction of the product by decades. Mm -hmm. yeah, Thank you. I, like I, I could just comment briefly that the, um, I believe the, the study in, in question um, presented by an earlier panel um, acknowledged that TBBPA is toxic. And their claim is that the, the exposure is so low that it's not a problem. But TBBPA is toxic. They acknowledge that. And why would you put a toxic chemical um, in a children's product that they will be exposed to when it's not necessary? Does anybody on the panel know whether or not EPA has looked at TBBPA in particular? No? Yes, this is Dr. Singla again. They, um, they have completed uh, an, an initial look at TBBPA, and, um, but have not actually done a risk assessment. So they have not drawn any conclusions yet as to the risks that TBBPA may or may not pose. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Provisky. Yeah, Commissioner, I'd, I'd like to answer a little bit differently in uh, something that uh, Dr. Lucas brought up a little bit earlier, that the when it comes to the fire aspects, and especially from the point of view of firefighter exposure and health, we have to not just look at the chemical in question. We have to look at the pyrolysis and combustion, uh, incomplete combustion products as they are generated in the high temperature environments. Mm -hmm. And those are, when, when it comes to chemicals that are produced such as dioxins and furans, the, uh, those, uh, a products, breakdown products, tend to be way, way more toxic than the original material that you started with. So it, to just narrow on uh, studies, uh, biological studies of the chemical itself, when you deal with the fire environment, is I think grossly unfair to public health uh, because you have to take into account what happens in fire. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Bobrowskis. Do you have, uh, why, why do you believe, why do you think that um, the UL standards include small open flame uh, performance tests for flammability on the exterior housing of uh, electrical components? Generally, okay, this is, um, this is a long story, and CPSC actually played a... Maybe 45 <laughs> seconds of our secretary yeah, is correct. I'll, I'll try to be very brief. The... Uh, uh, UL took a very odd stance with televisions compared to most other categories of electronic equipment. And there was, I think, a very unfortunate incident in the early 1970s, right as CPSC was being formed, where there were some manufacturers that were producing instant on television sets that were just uh, flaming right and left. And uh, UL and CPSC got together and said, we have to stop this dead in its tracks. That created a legacy, which was, you know, it was gross negligence on the part of the, a specific manufacturer, but it resulted in a complete distortion of that field, which has remained to this day because UL felt that its hands are tied, that it really can't back down on the safety issue, even though the safety issue is not there. Thank you very much, and I do want to thank uh, every member of the panel. Um, at this point, you, the panel is dismissed. Now, in terms of uh, the proceedings, uh, the commissioners were asked to forego making opening statements, but we were told we could have up to three minutes for a closing statement. Uh, I'm going to tell you I have no closing statement, but I will <laughs> ask my colleagues if they do. Commissioner Robinson. 
I will stick with the three minutes. First of all, I just want to thank all of the participants today. This was just incredibly informative, and we had such a talented group from so many different fields, and I really, really appreciate it. I confess when I first reviewed this petition that I did not do so with the limitations that are so specifically and explicitly put, built into the petition of being looking only at non-polymer additive organohalogen flame retardants in four product categories. And when you do that, it's something that I think that this commission should take very seriously. We're not looking at flame retardants, generally not at polymers, not at reactive um, applications, and not into other product categories. Um, I know that we know a lot about a few of these products, and I know about the methodology of the read across and why we have this category in front of us. I'm really looking forward to um, the comments that will come from uh, presumably people in this audience and beyond and also from our staff with respect to what um, the recommendations are and what we should do with respect to this, this petition. I think we start with the question that Linda Birnbaum said this morning that we should start with, and that is do we need these toxic chemicals in these four product categories? Um, in order to be safer. The step two that I would suggest is that is this a proper grouping scientifically for regulatory purposes? Um, look at the structural differences. Are they allowed? And do we have any different endpoints, although I've not heard any today? And my suggestion is that the third step would be, are these the proper cate product category? Should we have fewer? Should we have more? And the next question I would want to look at is whether if we were going to issue a ban, whether it would be a ban of only existing products or is there really something that we should be doing with respect to the, to the, the future products. Again, I look forward to um, the staff's comments and for all of this, the comments from the public um, with respect to uh, recommending whether we what we do with respect to these limited flame retardants in these limited products. And again, let me just say that we here at the Commission could not do our jobs without the kind of participation that we've seen today. And I'm just very, very grateful for it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, let me begin also by uh, commending and thanking the six panels who were here today. Uh, each and every panel added value to this discussion and to our knowledge about what's included in the petition. And so uh, to all the participants, thank you very much. Um, we can't, I often say this when I'm out speaking, we often say, I will say, I am not an expert. You are the experts. It's, it's why it's important for us to hear from all of you and why we will look forward to your comments um, as we proceed with this petition. As has become a theme of mine. I like to talk about incrementalism. And uh, any time you paint with a broad brush, I think uh, you can find yourself in a difficult situation, possibly eliminating some good and uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So to that end, uh, that is probably my biggest concern, is the depth of the petition. But today's testimony has been very valuable. And we look forward to um, really additional information, we will have QFRs and, uh, and go forward with in this inquiry. But again, um, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, we missed you being here today. I know you're watching. And uh, I've, if I appear like I've been texting throughout the hearing, it was with our chairman. So <laughs> um, we, uh, we know you're here with us in spirit. Thank you all very much. And again, we will look forward to, and I encourage the public to comment on this petition and to, uh, to let us hear your thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I also would like to thank all the participants and the panel members today uh, for providing the testimony. And in particular, uh, I want to thank and compliment our staff for uh, being able to put together uh, a very, very difficult hearing uh, off-site from my normal location, seamlessly uh, allowing others to contribute to not only facilities but IT, of course. Thank you very much. This was uh, tough sledding and done in a fantastic fashion. Um, I think today the, the idea and methodology as proposed by the petitioners in a class-based approach, um, there was a lot of compelling testimony uh, towards taking that approach, and there's a lot to think about. Um, from my perspective, um, in taking that kind of approach, it does subject um, the methodology to scrutiny should there be one single member of the class that for some um, uh, validated study has been found to be healthy 
uh, or safe in the use scenarios as, um, sub as uh, projected by the petitioners here, um, whether it be mouthing, whether it be inhalation, uh, dermal or hand-to-mouth or other exposure uh, patterns in vehicles. So there's much more to be found on that. I'm interested also in the f uh, to finding out more about uh, what our uh, sister agency at EPA has studied on potentially some of the chemicals uh, or class of chemicals in question. Uh, but um, I want to again thank everyone and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as our acting chairman, you did an admirable job in our chairman's absence. And of course, we all wish Mr. K uh, the best speedy recovery. So um, I would like, in just in closing for this entire panel, to thank the commissioners and their extraordinary staffs. A lot of what we do is uh, as a result of the uh, exceptional work done by our various staffs. So thank all of you. Uh, and Commissioner Mohorovic touched on a point that has to be stressed right now. We're sitting in a room that is not used to this kind of a hearing. And if you just stop and think about the logistics that went into this and the cameras and the remote uh, uh, phone in. It's just an in a huge challenge. So uh, there are just an enormous number of offices that need to be thanked. I'd love to go through individual by individual and thank them, but you have to understand who was involved in this. The Office of the Secretariat and our able secretary holding up the time cards uh, play, did a yeoman job. But the Office of Facilities Management, our Office of Information Technology, our Office of Communications, the Office of the General Counsel in telling us uh, the rules of the road for asking questions, and of course our very modest Office of the Executive Director and Patricia Atkins. Thank you all for appearing today. This was an extraordinary day and we really appreciate it.